Sports say, hey guys, it's Klaus. Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you guys? How's your day starting? Well, my day's just starting, but who knows what part of the day it is for you. People watching from all over the world. And I'm in a good mood because I was just reading on the internet. Uh, I'm sure everyone, all of you from anywhere, wherever you are, have heard the story. Those kids in the cave, the soccer team and the coach from Thailand that were trapped in that cave uh, with the four kilometers of underwater passageways and they've been rescued. Isn't that great news? I thought I'd just mention it here because, you know, shout out to everyone who, who helped rescue those kids. That was fantastic. Everyone involved, all the authorities down in Thailand and apparently hundreds and hundreds of volunteers from all over the world. Some of the best divers, most experienced divers from all over the world went down there. And it's amazing what we can do uh, when faced with adversity and we put our minds together and actually get something done. That, that was a great day and great news and I'm happy about it. And I hope you are too. And anyone who's fixated with uh, things like, oh, why were they there? Why were they in the cave in the first place? Who brought them there? Whose fault is it? Well, you know what? Fuck off. This is great news. They're all safe and it's a happy ending. And that's the intro for today. Let's get into it now. Yeah, back to our, uh, our world here. Mad Hatter Jack from the STSG clan. Shout out to you guys too. We're going to learn a little bit about the game in this replay. I'm in a good mood, so we're actually going to uh, talk about the game and, and learn something about it. How about that for a change? Huh? Here he goes. Well, the first thing is he's in a Russian heavy tank, which is a really good choice. That's the first thing you got to know about the game. If you don't know what line to go down, go down the Russian lines because they're the best uh, in every category other than artillery, maybe. So that's the first thing. If you're a beginner, you know, that's probably... Uh, uh, really important to know. Let's watch what he does here. He's playing in counter mode, which means there's one base on Erlenberg. And the base is in the middle. So where is he going? To the edge of the map, to camp, right? No, he's going right for the base. Why? Because it's in counter mode. There's only one base. And that's where the action is. He could put cap pressure, make the enemy team move to reset. He's in the middle where he's going to be in the thick of things. He'll get the most XP. See, you've learned two things already. Number one is go down the Russian lines. And number two is during encounter mode, don't camp as far away from the encounter as possible. Uh, that's already worth it. See, the video's already been worthwhile. All right, let's uh, keep watching here. The third thing you're going to learn is don't venture out into the open when you know there's a whole bunch of people camping in the bushes over there. And what are they going to, what could they do there if you just sit in the base? Nothing. They have to expose themselves. In certain situations, camping is good when you know you're setting up an ambush. But in an encounter mode, look, they're in the base now. Uh, the enemies have to move forward. The campers can just sit there and wait while the fight happens here. And there are going to be some uh, enemies. Well, either you cap and win or some enemies are going to move forward to fight you. And he's top tier in an IS-3. So this is the perfect strategy. Let's watch him play. That's all right. Now, the other thing you have to know is that when you're playing Russian tanks, you don't have to aim completely to hit your shots like that. Because if you aim completely, it reduces your DPM and gives the enemies chance to aim back at you. There. So how many things have we learned so far? Three. Let's learn one more thing. When the cap counter is not progressing, it means there's an enemy in the base with you. And there he is. Yeah, that's four things already. What else could we learn? Uh, uh, that artillery is a pain in the fucking ass. There you go. Five things. The artillery, pain in the ass. They can shoot you and you don't even know where they are. Well, there's an arrow that tells you, but you can't shoot back because they're safe, because they're artillery. Uh, we've learned quite a bit so far. Is there anything else we could learn? Um, let's talk about tanks a little bit. Oh, there's one. It's an AMX CDC. That's a premium tank, tier eight. It costs money. Under no circumstances should you buy an AMX CDC because it is a huge pile of shit. Oh, but Klaus, I watched uh, a Unicom do a review on the CDC and he got Ace Tanker and he said it was really maneuverable and, and had good gun depression. And if, you, if those attributes fit your play style, maybe you would enjoy it. You could buy one and like, well, you know what? He got the tank for free, he played it on a special account and he played 87 games and he hated that piece of shit. But he showed you the Ace Tanker game, which he put on YouTube. 
And then you watched it and you went out and bought it. And he got Ace Tanker because he's a Unicom. But you suck. And you'll never get Ace Tanker because it's a piece of shit. And he never plays it anymore because he doesn't want to lower his WN8. Okay, and did I mention that artillery is a pain in the ass? It stuns you all the time. Oh, we already learned that. Uh, we're learning so much I can't keep track here. Okay, what else can we learn? Uh, let me think for a second. Uh, well, let's learn about armor. How does armor work? Well, uh, I guess the most important thing is um, keep your front pointed at the enemy. Okay, uh, like this. Point your front at the enemy and they have a harder time hurting you. Then if you point, see, it, it doesn't hurt when you point your front at the enemy usually, rather than your side or your rear. Uh, did I teach you about the not aiming? No, just stop! What you, did I teach you? Oh yeah, we already learned that. It's important to note that that is more effective in Russian tanks than other tanks. Klaus, I enjoyed this video, but what you said about the CDC wasn't very nice. It's, it's actually pretty good if you know how to drive, if, if you know what you're doing. Uh, you don't believe me about the CDC? Okay, let's, um, where's that CDC? Let's figure it out here. Uh, oh, there he is, he's full health. Let's see what happens. Uh, they're both tier eight. Uh, see what happens here. Uh, come on, CDC, you can do it. Uh, what's the alpha on that CDC gun? Uh, I can't remember, uh, what is the alpha? Zero, I think. Um, it's maneuverable, though. It uh, tends to be able to uh, do well in the open spaces. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's only 60 bucks or so. Uh, uh, and if you think this kind of thing would be suitable to your playstyle, uh, go ahead and buy one. If you don't like it, you can always uh, spend some more and uh, uh, trade it in for something else. Uh, what else can we learn here? Uh... Let's see, uh, armor, let's learn about armor. Uh, some tanks have a lot of armor, well, which usually means they're heavier and therefore uh, slower and less maneuverable and can't really reposition quickly. Unless, unless of course, you're Russian and uh, then you're, you, you're really fast. Uh, have we learned pretty much everything uh, that there is to, to know? I think we've covered most of it. Uh, if you can think of anything else, leave it in the comments and maybe I'll do a follow-up video. I think we've pretty much got it covered. Did I mention the camping around the edges? That uh, really you don't uh, accomplish much doing that in an encounter. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that. Uh, I think we pretty much covered everything. Let's just jump to the post-game stats because nothing else is going to happen. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, sometimes you, uh, you get a special team, like this one that has three players that have negative one kills. Uh, which just means there's more damage for you to do. Yeah, switching topics now back to the rescue in Thailand. I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, why didn't they just use the submarine that Elon Musk uh, was rushing over there. He was trying to help out, you know, and uh, good on him for trying to help. But there was a reason. I know I read some articles and, and uh, saw a lot of comments. Why didn't they just use a submarine? And they could just put the kids in there and... Well, there's a reason that didn't work, and I think it was a great effort by uh, Musk to try and help out. Uh, but there was no chance that a submarine would work under these circumstances. And I'll explain it to you because, uh, you know, I think about these things. I got a lot of free time. It would have been great if, say, there it was a situation where there was a, a capsized ship, uh, ocean liner, and they had to go uh, in through the corridors and doors and try and rescue people uh, under great pressure that in a situation where they couldn't scuba out. So building a small little submarine like that, maybe a remote control that they could drive there and have the people get in and then navigate their way out to the surface. Maybe he could use this in the future, but in the case of the cave, uh, the situation there was the, the kids were four kilometers in this cave, this cavernous network. Portions of it were underwater. It wasn't like underwater the whole way. It was... And we don't have a clear picture, but just from what I gathered from reading, there were portions, uh, you know, 500 meters underwater, and then the cave would come up above the water level, and there'd be uh, another 100 meters where you have to walk through uh, caverns and, and actually walk and cave, crawl through some space, and then it would go back into the water, and then you'd have to go another 
long way in water and then another part that was above the water the cave meandered and uh, and wandered in elevation left and right up and down and depending on how uh, the water table was was shifting parts of it were underwater and parts of it were not underwater so it makes it impossible for a submarine to work now most people think a submarine uh, in their head they just think oh it's a little tube they adapted it you put the kid in the tube it's airtight there's air in there and then you just you know you go but think about it if you have a a, a tube say it's a, a foot and a half two feet in diameter and four or five feet long I, i'm just guessing uh, what happens if you put a sealed tube like that in water well, it floats, right? That's not a submarine. That's just a, a, a capsule that floats in the water. You'd never get push that under the water to move it anywhere. A submarine needs, needs ballast. And basically what that is, is the capsule itself displaces a volume of water. That volume of water has, uh, uh, has mass. And the amount of water it's displaced it causes that capsule to have buoyancy. It wants to pop up to the surface. So you have to add weight to it to counterbalance that so that it is a, reaches an equilibrium when it, it could just hover under the water, not floating and not sinking. A cylinder with a radius of one foot, four feet in length, uh, displaces 12.5 cubic feet of volume. Uh, for all of you not from the United States, that's about a third of a cubic meter. How much does a third of a cubic meter of water weigh? Well, that's a third of a ton. That's about 330 kilograms. That's over 600 pounds. Even if they made it a lot smaller than what I just estimated there, if they made it half that size, that's still 300 pounds. That's how much this thing would require in ballast so that it wouldn't just pop up and float at the top, allowing it to be navigated through uh, uh, tunnels filled with water like a submarine. Well, what happens when they navigate this thing and they get to a part that uh, where they have to cave for 200 meters over dry land in a you know in some sort of a cavern? They they couldn't possibly lug this thing a third of a ton thing around, right? It's uh, submarines are meant to stay underwater, and uh, that's why uh, the idea of a submarine was a non-starter in this situation where you had to go underwater and then overland underwater and overland there would just be too much weight to carry around now those divers did a fantastic job what they did is they basically uh, put a mask and uh, on a kid and then the kid was his own submarine they just guided one in front one behind and guided him through <sighs> so it's a great story i'm sure more information is going to come out and eventually there's going to be a movie about it right you know there's going to be a movie. I just wanted to chat about it because I found it really interesting. And hats off and shout out to everyone who helped and all the kids and coach and everyone who was rescued there. You know, uh, I salute all of you. Even the Musk team and everyone who, who tried to help. Stuff that didn't work. It's better to just throw out ideas. And it's amazing how everyone tried to do something. Uh, and it is unfortunate, but true. Uh, that it is in times of adversity. We have to go through times of adversity uh, to have everyone come together and try and work to a common goal. But it's, a, it's great when it happens, and I just wanted to chat a bit about it. Thanks, guys, for watching.